begin reading here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 at verse 10, and I'll read to verse 17 and get into our study. Paul writes, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, as we enter into this passage here and we pick up at verse 10, Paul has been outlining conditions that would exist uh, in uh, the time just prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Now, in some ways, these conditions would exist because the church had been infiltrated. The combination of False teachers and bad doctrine has produced a weakness. And so his exhortation as he's continuing what he has just been writing to Timothy would be simply this. Timothy, you're a genuine teacher, so remain firm and steadfast in your doctrine. Now, that's what he has been doing. That's why Paul in verse 10 can say to him, you, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. That's because he's encouraging him. He's exhorting him to remain faithful in the things that he has learned from the apostle Paul. You, in other words, are distinct from the false teachers because you're sincere. You're a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. You have been a true disciple. See, Paul is getting ready to lay down his life. He knows that his his time is short and that it's time that he's going to end up uh, going to be with the Lord in heaven and all. And so he's encouraging him in this way. In a way, he might be saying to him something like this. He may be saying to him, Timothy, I showed you how to live and now I'm encouraging you so that you may know how you may die. Paul in chapter 4 is going to be speaking concerning his time of departure being at hand. In other words, he knows that he's about to go and and be with the Lord. And so what he's doing is he's equipping his young protege, the young man that he's been mentoring, a a genuine son in the faith. He's equipping him for works of service. That's what he's doing here. And, And he's saying to him, you can use me as a model. I want you to notice how he says, you have carefully followed. Now, notice the first two things, and we'll look at this in some detail in a moment. But notice he says, you have carefully followed my doctrine and manner of life. Doctrine and manner of life. Christianity is more than simply a a set of rules and regulations. It's more than a moral code. It's more than a system of ethics. It's, It's deeper than a simple philosophy. Christianity is something that is not only taught even as we look at the Bible and try and find points in it that we can we can understand the ways of God and and then yield to and and have information concerning the things of God and all. It's not simply something that is is coming to you in this form where I open the Bible and speak to you, but it is something that is also not simply taught, it is also caught. And the way that it is caught is by learning a manner of life. That's why the first two things that he speaks about here is my doctrine and manner of life. The things that I have taught you and the way that I have lived in front of you. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. To the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1, Paul could write, imitate me as I also imitate Jesus Christ. And Paul is using himself as an example of what a believer is to, to believe as well as how a believer is to behave. Some things you can learn through books and all. Some things through necessity you have to learn through books. Other things you can learn through a combination of, of, uh, of uh, this kind of teaching, speaking and reading and all, and doing. For example, when you learn to drive a car, you probably had a combination of the two. You had to go, if you, if you had to, I had to go to... Uh, the classes where they teach you the theories and everything about driving. They show us films and, and all of that. So there was one thing they could teach you when you climb into a driver's seat. You're supposed to, you know, set the, the seat at a comfortable place. You're supposed to have your hands in, you know, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock and all of that. And you, how to turn the car on. All of this is theory until you get behind the wheel. And then when you get behind the wheel, the theory is supposed to become practice. That's how it works. And, and the more you drive, the better 
you drive, hopefully, over time. That's how it's supposed to work anyway. And so driving is that way. Some things you learn through lecture as well as doing. All things are going to be learned by doing, though. You're going to have to put these things into practice. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. He's saying you have become somebody who has learned not simply the doctrine in the sense of being able to to assent to certain things that I've taught to you about uh, Jesus Christ, God, the Bible, heaven, hell, salvation. You have assented to those things, but you've also seen how a Christian lives. And that's what Paul begins to speak about here. During the time of Christ, as well as the, the time of Paul, first century rabbis would actually raise up disciples with a certain methodology. In discipleship, during the time of Paul, a disciple was one who would follow a teacher. He would make his mind up to follow a teacher. Then that disciple would begin to memorize the words of their teacher. They would learn the way of ministry. Then they would imitate life and character. And ultimately, they would themselves begin to train up other disciples. That's what Paul is alluding to in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, when he said in that verse, the things uh, that you have heard from me, Among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so Paul has been the mentor in the life of Timothy. This young pastor has used Paul as an example. And there are certain things that that he has carefully followed. Paul begins to share those things for us in verses 10 and 11. He says, you have carefully followed my doctrine. When he speaks of doctrine, that speaks of my teaching. You have carefully followed my teaching concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have carefully followed my manner of life. In other words, you have seen the way that I live amongst the people. You have seen my priorities. You've seen my unselfish consecration. And you have followed my manner of life. You have followed my purpose. When he speaks about his purpose, that's my chief aim in life. That's the thing that makes me what I am. Every individual, in other words, has a master passion. Jesus taught us that this is true. And he said, you just need to make a decision what your master passion is going to be. You cannot serve two masters. You have to choose to cling to one and discard the other. You cannot hold fast to God and you cannot hold fast to the enemy. You have to decide who you're going to cling to. That's something you find from the time of the Old to the New Testament. Joshua says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so there's a master passion in your life. There is, there is something that motivates you. What is it? What is it that causes your heart to be fast? What is it that you think about, that you do, that you want to do, you want to do better? What is it? Well, for Paul, he'd be saying, you know my purpose, you know my chief aim, you know my goal. You know, as I said to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know that. You know the purpose of my life is to love God with everything that is within me and to learn to love others as I love myself. You know that Jesus Christ has taught us that you know my purpose in life. You know my chief aim. You know my faith. You know my faith towards God. The faith that I have towards God that has resulted in my salvation. You know my long suffering, which is my patience. The patience that I've had with people, especially the patience that I've had with people who have persecuted me. You know that I've endured with a long suffering attitude. You know my, you know my persecutions that I've gone through throughout my entire ministry. You're familiar with them. You know the afflictions that I've gone through for the sake of Jesus Christ. You know the pain that I've endured. You know about what happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium. You know what happened in Lystra. That's what he's referring to there in verse 11 when he speaks of those persecutions that Timothy would be familiar with because that's where Timothy had been saved and thus would understand that. But he also goes on to say this in verse 11. He says concerning persecutions, concerning afflictions that he endured, and this he says, out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now that's something that I marked in my scriptures. I mark that down out of them all. The Lord delivered me because God faithfully preserved him. He went in, but he also came out. And that's how it works in the things of the Lord. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 43, verse two, the Old Testament prophet says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers. They shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. God delivered me from all of those things. The Lord will deliver me from all of those things. In a sense, you are invulnerable until it's your time to go home to be with the Lord. 
You are invulnerable. No, I'm not saying go climb on top of the church and jump just to see, because that may be your time to go to be with the Lord when you hit the ground. It's not the fall that kills you anyway. You know that it's the sudden impact. But he, he, he is teaching us that we have a time that we are going to go and be with the Lord. I believe very strongly that the Lord will deliver you until that ultimate moment of deliverance to be seeing him in his, in his presence. And that's what Paul is speaking about. Timothy, you know, I've gone through some pretty tough things. You, you are aware of the persecutions that I've gone through. And by the way, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This is one of those promises that we believers don't want to memorize. We, we like the promises that say that God will be with us. I do. I, I like those promises that say God is going to bless me when I go out and when I come in. That's a wonderful promise. I, I like the promises of the Lord. But when I read my Bible and I read things like that, I'm certain I'm reading somebody else's Bible. For sure, this is the promise of the day for Marie, but it isn't for me. I'm not somebody who really likes persecution. And yet the bottom line is that all who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Those who live in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ will endure hardship. There's just no doubt about that. In John, in chapter 16, verse 2, you can multiply this many times through the Gospels. Jesus gives many, many uh, verses that relate to affliction and persecution. But John 16, verse 2 is a, a scripture where Jesus said, They shall put you out of the synagogues. The time comes that whoever kills you will think that he does God's service. The time will come when those who kill you will think that he is doing God's service. It's an act of worship to the God that he worships and serves. We know that the Apostle Paul, when uh, prior to him coming to Christ, we know that Paul threatened, breathed out threatenings and persecution against believers. We know that Paul actually stood as a witness to the martyrdom of the first martyr of the church when Stephen received a stoning. We know that he had received uh, letters so that he could go to uh, Syria, to Damascus, in order that he might arrest anybody who was following, following Jesus Christ and bring them back and have them tried as a heretic. Four different times in the book of Acts, Paul speaks concerning his, his testimony or his testimony is referred to. And in the book of Acts, he makes it very clear that he persecuted believers to the death. That was the Apostle Paul. And yet, as he was on the road to Damascus, instead of arresting believers, he was arrested by Jesus Christ. So he's somebody who could speak concerning the fact that those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Because one, he persecuted the saints. And two, Jesus has stated that there will be a time coming when people who kill you think they're doing God's service. And Paul was someone who thought he was doing God's service. But that's not just 2,000 years ago, because we know that to this day, there are some from radical belief systems, such as radical Islam, who believes that by cutting a Christian's head off, they are doing God's service. Now, Paul was making it very clear here that this is going to take place. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so persecution is part of being a believer. You are a light in a very dark place. You are salt in a decaying world. And so you need and I need to be prepared for that. And that's what Paul is speaking about. So he's saying to Timothy, these are the things that I've gone through and you're well aware of that. But re realize this will also take place in your life. He goes on in verse 13 and he says, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So a sign of the last days, once again, is evil men and imposters growing worse and worse. The word evil speaks of that which is wicked. It speaks of the peril to the Christian faith that's going to take place, to those who are steadfast in faith in Christ. It speaks of the pain and trouble and suffering that people are going to encounter through those who are evil. It speaks of imposters. That word imposter is a seducer. It's somebody who is a mind deceiver. Deceiver. And so he's saying in the last days, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. They're going to proceed from worse to worse. They're going to be deceived and even more deceived as time comes on. Today, we're living in the last days. There's no doubt about that. And today we are witnessing this. It's not difficult for us to turn on a TV program and hear somebody say things that are basically just not true. They're not scriptural. And sometimes they're saying that in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not difficult for us to go to a donut shop or to open the door to somebody who's going to knock on the door and tell us things about God that are simply not found in the scriptures. It's not difficult at all for that to take place because it takes place basically every day. 
And there are many believers today, because they are spiritually naive or immature, there are many believers today who are, are subject to this deception because they have an attitude with a lack of discernment. Maybe their faith is so casual that they don't take it seriously and thus don't even know when they're being deceived. But I can guarantee you, deception is rampant today. Just this last week... On uh, the 6th, uh, December 6th, when, when Mitt Romney was speaking uh, at the George Bush Presidential Library and was giving a speech there in, in College Station, Texas, uh, he wanted to address faith in the United States and his own faith. And, and most of you probably heard excerpts, if not the entire speech. And, and I did hear his speech and, and I took the transcripts down because I found something he said interesting. And let me use it as an illustration. He said this. He said, there is one fundamental question about which I often am asked. What do I believe about Jesus Christ? And now he gives his answer. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of mankind. My church's beliefs about Christ may not all be the same as those of other faiths. Each religion has its own unique doctrines and history. These are not bases for criticism, but rather a test of our tolerance. Religious tolerance would be a shallow principle indeed if it were reserved only for faiths with which we agree. And that got a, a thunderous response and applause. But for me, as a Christian and one who wants to be discerning, I heard something there that I couldn't applaud. And this is what I heard. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and Savior of mankind. Now, now many people, perhaps even in this church building this morning, would say, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is you're using the name Jesus Christ and the word Savior in a way that isn't biblical. Why? Because Mormons don't believe what you believe if you're a Christian. You see, Mormonism believes and teaches that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, that God has a physical body, that people exist as spirits before they're born so they can be exalted as gods and have their own planets. Mormonism teaches that Jesus is a God amongst other gods, that the Bible is not a complete revelation and you need the pearl, great price, doctrines and covenants in the Book of Mormon. They believe in a variety of things that are not found in Scripture. They baptize people for the dead. There's a variety of things that they do that are not found in Scripture. But if you hear him say, I believe Jesus is the Savior of mankind, he's my Savior, he's my personal Savior, then you might, as a, as a Christian, you might be saying, well, what's the difference between us and, and what Mormons believe? What Mormons believe is not found in scripture and that's your problem and there's a deception a tremendous deception in the spirit of this age is the spirit of tolerance as long as they use the name jesus it's okay paul would differ with that jesus christ would differ with that the old testament prophets would differ with that because what counts is what scripture says you see and we'll see that in just a moment See, Paul, when Paul was speaking, it's found in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 29 and 30, when he was speaking to some elders of the church of Ephesus there in the city of Miletus, this is what he said to them. He said, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There is going to be a deception from the outside and from the inside. There will be people who claim to be Christians who will be saying this is the truth and will draw people to follow after the things that they're teaching. You see, the remedy to deception is knowing God's word. The, the remedy to deception is studying God's word regularly and systematically. It's understanding the great commission that Jesus gave to the church in Matthew in chapter 28, 19 and 20. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age, teaching them, he says, to obey everything I've commanded you. And so the way to know everything he commanded is to do a verse by verse study through the Bible. That's how it works. That's how I'm going to know everything that he commanded so I can know what to obey. That's why Paul could say in Acts 20, verse 27, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. I have taught you from Alpha to Omega, from the A to the Z, so that you might be completely, thoroughly furnished for every good work. That's what Christianity stands and falls on, the Word of God. And so we know here, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, and we are seeing it even today. When pastors fail to teach the whole counsel of God, people are not equipped to discern truth from error. And the Word of God gives us the ability to dis discern as well as resist deception.
That's what Ephesians 4.14 says when Paul said, We should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. Deception. Deception. And that's what he's speaking about. Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse being deceiving and being deceived. But he moves on in verse 14 in contrast. But you... You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So in contrast, I want you to know that I see you as abiding faithfully in the teachings of God's word. You have not only learned, but you have been assured of these things. You are confidently clinging to the truth of the gospel in a personal way. You have personally been set free by the truth found in the gospel. And by the way, that came because you were raised that way. Now, he has a mother and a grandmother who were believers. He has a mother by the name of Lois and a grandmother by the name of Eunice. And so these have been tremendous influences in your life. He had a godly mother, a godly grandmother who prepared him. Now, how did they prepare him to to be able to receive Christ? Notice verse 15. From childhood, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Your mom and your grandmother did the right thing. You see, Timothy had a pagan father. He was born of a Jewish mother, but he had a Greek father. And so the Jewish mother raised him in the ways of God. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When you train up a child, what you do is you provoke them to have a hunger for the right things. Training up carries with it the connotation of of a Jewish midwife when she was attending the birth of a child. And when the baby would part the womb, the Jewish midwife would take date honey, apply some of it to the lips of the baby, and thus would, would cause the sucking reflex to occur so that that baby could nurse from uh, uh, and and receive mother's milk. So the midwife would provoke this reflex by touching their mouth and they were training up that child. They were training that mouth to be ready to receive uh, nourishment. The way that you and I train our children up is through the word of God. That's what happened with Timothy. Timothy had a grandmother and had a mama who was in love with with God's word. And so as they would study and read the word of God, they imparted to Timothy these things. From infancy, literally, he's saying, you were taught God's word and your education was God-centered. When you go to Israel, as we have on a a Sabbath night, you can walk by an Orthodox uh, synagogue And as you walk by the synagogue, which we have done more than once, as you walk by the synagogue, you will see that there are the men in a room being taught the word. They're being taught whatever they are taught there in synagogue. But there'll be a playground where the children are playing. And not only are the children playing there, but the wives, mothers of those children and wives of the husbands who are there in the synagogue service, they're there. They're not even receiving instruction. And, and I was there looking across at this take place once and I spoke to my Orthodox Jewish guide and I asked them, why? Why are the kids not in a Sunday school kind of thing like we do in the Christian church in the United States? And, and why are the women not in their receiving instruction there in a, in a temple service? Why isn't that taking place? And my Orthodox Jewish friend said to me, because the men have been called by God to be the priests of the home. They're the ones who are to be equipped so that they can lead that household. The children are not accountable at this point. It's the father father that has a responsibility of training that child up in the ways of God so that that child will not depart later on in its life. It isn't even on the mothers. He said it's on the fathers. And when you go all the way back in Jewish history, that's basically what happened. When a baby was born, the midwife would provoke the the, nursing reflex. The mother would nurse as the mama nursed that baby to a certain point and certain age. She would repeat certain phrases and certain things about the Lord to her. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. She would share things with them. But when that child began to speak and was capable was actually weaned and capable of learning the father took over his education at that point and would raise that child up in the way of the lord timothy didn't have a father that did that but he did have a grandmother who did and he did have a mother who did and paul congratulates him and reminds him about that and says from childhood you have known the holy scriptures you had a mother 
who knew that you would learn the fear of the Lord as being the beginning of knowledge because she studied Proverbs 1 7. You had a mother who knew that you were sinful from birth and needed to be directed because she knew Psalm 51 5. Your mother knew the word of God, Timothy, and she raised you right. She raised you to have a fear of God and a knowledge of your own mortality. That came from Scripture, and that's what you received. That's how we get at ourselves, by the way, is by being raised in the Word of God. Notice how he says, From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's why we emphasize the study of God's Word. It's the Scriptures that are able to make you wise into salvation. It's the Word of God. I put a, I put a large premium on worship. I, I I think it's a great thing to worship in the sense of singing songs and praise to God. And I thank God because he's given to us very talented, worshipful leaders who help us to worship God in song. But singing songs to God is, is one thing. Knowing his word and being made wise into salvation through his word is another. Because I may enjoy singing, and I do, and I might enjoy singing worship songs, and I do. But if I have somebody coming to my door, knocking on the door, telling me that Jesus is the first creation of God, I could sing to them all day long, but I'm not going to lead them to Christ. It's the, it's the word of God that brings you to salvation, and that's what he's speaking about. And he said from a baby, from babyhood, literally, when he says from childhood, literally, it is from infancy, from infanthood, from babyhood, from the time you were small, you had a grandmother and you had a mother who would give you the word of God, Timothy, so that when God's gospel was presented to you, you had a conscience that was sensitive. I was reading about a fellow who works in, um, he works with, with kids in gangs. And he said, you know, I can I can talk to some kids and I will say to them, I will say to them, you know, that's not right. He said, I will, I'll speak to an African-American kid and I'll say to him, you know, that's not right. He says, and inevitably that African-American kid will say, I know it's not. He says, I can speak to Hispanic kids, he says, and I'll say to him, you know, that's not right. And they will say, I know it's not. And he says, you know why? Do you know why they know it's not right? He says, because inevitably they had moms who took them to church when they were small. He said they would go to church services. They had preachers who would speak to them about God. And they knew there was right and they knew there was wrong. I could say that in my own life and many of you can say the same thing. I was raised in a God-fearing home. I went to uh, catechism classes as a kid. So when I did something wrong and somebody said, you know that's wrong. You know stealing's wrong. You know lying's wrong. You know your temper, that's wrong. I would say... I know, because I had a conscience. My conscience had been formulated by, by the teaching, religious instruction, you see. But when you don't have that, when you say to somebody what you did is wrong, and they look at you and say, why is that wrong if it makes me happy? Inevitably, that person was not raised in a home that feared God at all. Timothy was somebody who was raised in a God-fearing home. Though his father was a pagan, his mother believed. And so when Paul came into his town and was bringing the message and his mom embraced and his grandmother embraced Jesus Christ, it was something that he was open to too. And that's why he says that from childhood, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he moves on in verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, as we look at this, he speaks concerning scripture being inspired by God. It is God breathed that prepares you for a life of service. And not only will it benefit Timothy, but it benefits any who trusts in it. But notice what he says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture that would include the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. That could include the letters that were being written at that time. You see, during this period, the entire New Testament writings had yet to be collected. The recognition of the 27 New Testament books had yet to occur. The official gathering and recognizing of what is called New Testament canon didn't occur until the Council of Hippo, where a very large group of men showed up. 393 A.D. Then there was a second council called the Council of Carthage in 397 when they said these are the 27 acceptable books that are regarded as inspired by God. But prior to that, there's evidence that the apostles recognized their writings of having an authority. 
For example, the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter in chapter uh, 3 verse 16 was speaking concerning the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Peter said this concerning Paul. He said, Paul writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. In 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul said, Scripture says, Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. But what he did there is he mixed two scriptures. He mixed an Old Testament book, Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, about muzzling the ox. But he also quoted Luke chapter 10, verse 7, showing us that the Old and the New Testament are regarded as scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Peter, speaking of the inspiration of Scripture, meaning that Scripture owes its origin to the breath of God, it's the outpouring of his life to man, Peter said, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we have an inspiration not a theory, but the fact God carried the writers along. He inspired them to write his words. Now, John doesn't write like Paul, who doesn't write like the Apostle Peter. They write differently, but it's what we call truth through personality. You will read the Apostle John and he will use certain words that Paul doesn't use, but they're similar words. They're similar words in the sense that they have the same content. And so all scripture is given by inspiration of God and notice it is profitable. What is it profitable for? Well, he tells us, he says it's profitable for doctrine. The word doctrine speaks of teaching. It provokes us to learn. It informs us about God's revelation in Jesus Christ. He says it's profitable for rebuking, which speaks of correcting error and an error in understanding an error of behavior. He speaks of correction, which is really a restoration to a right relationship with God. And, and it speaks of training, because I, if I yield to the word of God and practice it, I develop understanding in the ways of God. Scripture is valuable in all those ways. And that's why we study the word of God. And that's why we put a high emphasis on the on the reading of the word of God and 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 prayerfully the obeying of what God says, because he's going to train us to do those things that are pleasing to him. He says the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God's word is spoken of as being sufficient to equip us to do everything that pleases him. Now, the Bible tells us, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. He says, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against you. Jesus made it very clear to us that his words are spirit and they are life. Jesus said it is the truth that sets you free. So when we get the word of God, which is the sword of the Lord, and we, and we memorize it, it, it teaches us the ways of God. It protects us from the dangers of our lives that, that he, can, he can keep us from things that are injurious to us that will be permanently uh, damaging to the point of sometimes even crippling us as people. As we read the word of God, we see his blessings and we see his warnings and we embrace them. And our lives are changed because of the word of God. For us, it's not a feeling. For us, it's, it's, it's a fact that we place a, our faith in. And then the feelings will follow afterwards. Some things that, that the word of God says, I don't understand at that moment. And so what I do is I file those things in a, in a kind of a, I will review this later compartment in my life. The things that disturb me aren't the things, though, that I don't understand. The things that can be disturbing to me are the things that I do understand. And so a long time ago, I began to make a decision that as much as I understand, that I will try to obey. And in doing that, I've grown to know the Lord's ways in a way that I didn't before. The only way that that's going to take place in any of our lives, guys, is studying God's Word. That's why we put a high premium on the study of the Word of God in this fellowship. From the very beginning, when we began this work and the Lord was placing on my heart to have pillars for this church, I want you, if you know the pillars of this church, the four W's, the first W is God's word. The first W, God's word and worship and witness and witness, God's word, because I want to know his word.
As I've shared with you before, perhaps even recently, this platform that I'm standing on, when you remove the carpet and you look at everything there from the steps up to the very back over here, we had a day where people came and they wrote scriptures all over this platform, all underneath me, everywhere there is. If I were to pull this carpet up and it was still uh, readable, you would see scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. I'm standing on a scripture that tells me that Jesus Christ is the only foundation. That's the scripture I stand on every time I preach. Right underneath this mat, I went there and I wrote 1 Corinthians 3 and I wrote that scripture down to remind myself every time that I teach the Bible that I stand on the Word of God every time I teach the Word of God that's what it should be like that's what Paul is talking about Timothy Timothy there are t times coming when deceptive individuals, imposters, and evil men are going to enter into the church. Now, you know my manner of life, and you know my doctrine, and you know the things that I've gone through. You know the persecutions and afflictions that I've encountered, but you also know that God has delivered me from all of these things. But you know, Timothy, you were raised in a proper way because you had a grandmother and a mother who taught you God's Word. God's Word which prepared your heart to become a saved individual because you know God's Word is truth. It's inspired by God. And so as you have, you have come to know God's Word through the doctrine and correction, through the, through the reproofs and, and all the instruction that you receive from it, you've been thoroughly equipped for every good work. And this is what God intends for you as a pastor. So stay in the Word of God. Encourage people to love the Word of God, remain faithful to the things of God, you will be a faithful messenger of God's Word to the point where you will be saved from the deception and, and those who will, will, will imposters uh, presenting themselves as genuine workers of Christ, you will be saving yourself and those who listen to you, so remain faithful to the Word of God. God's Word is inspired. You can trust it. You can hold fast to him and his word is true. God is not a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar, Paul says. And you can trust the word of God. And Timothy, you need to do so because that's how you're going to cleanse your ways. That's how you're going to be saved. And that's how you can give a message to others that will encourage them to have a relationship with Jesus Christ too. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season, Timothy. Remain faithful to the things of God and watch God bless your life and the hearers. Those who hear and do, watch what God does in them to preach the word. Our Father, we ask that you would work in us and continue to reveal yourself to us and through us. Lord, I lift up this congregation to you that we would truly hunger after righteousness, hunger for your word. Lord, desire to be those whom you are pleased with. So I lift this congregation to you. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us rightly divide your word, your word of truth, and help us to apply it properly in our own lives.